So the, the first, um, first question is, what, what is melanoma? And I always tell, it's, it's important to understand this is just a, a cancer of cells that's, that uh, of the cells in your body that give you pigmentation. So you have them everywhere. And um, they're primarily in the skin, but you can have them behind the eye, or you can have them in the, in the sinuses, or the oral cavity, or the rectum, and for women, even in the vulva or vagina. Those are actually different kinds of melanomas. Uh, even though they look the same, they start from the same cell type, they, they actually um, have very different biology. Um, most of the melanomas, though, are skin melanomas, and they, they come because of, skin ex of sun exposure. At least we believe that sun exposure is very important. Um, and the, the, what happens really is that when, when the DNA in the cell gets damaged, the cell develops special properties. New proteins are produced. Other proteins that are important for the cell to maintain its normal status aren't made. And so what I usually tell my, my patients is that these cells gain superpowers. They, they, they can do things that normal cells can't do. They can grow uncontrollably. They can get into the blood and lymphatics and go to other organs. And most significantly, they can implant in other organs and sort of sit there. Sometimes they can sit there for a few days, sometimes for 25 years before they start to grow. And this whole process of dormancy, why they don't grow over that period of time, we don't understand. It may be because the immune system is controlling it during that time, but we really don't, don't know. Um, and and when, we, when we see somebody with a primary melanoma, we, we can't tell whether those cells are in their body or not because they're such small deposits that they can't be detected by CT scan or PET scan. So we can assess potential risk, but we can't tell them with any certainty whether they are or are not cured of their melanoma when their primary melanoma is taken out. This is what a, a melanoma looks like. I never see this um, because I, I treat people who've already had their melanoma taken out by their dermatologist and the plastic surgeon. So in all my practice, I can remember once or twice when I've seen this. In fact, the best example was at a cocktail party <laughs> where somebody showed me something underneath their fingernail and said, I have this strange thing under my fingernail. I don't know what it is. And I said, oh, that doesn't look too good. You better go to your dermatologist. And literally a month later, he came back to me having had his, the melanoma underneath his fingernail removed and, um, and, and a lymph node dissection. And, and then we, we started treating him. But really what, what dermatologists look for is these five characteristics, five or six characteristics, it's got to be asymmetrical, the borders are irregular, the, there's a difference in color in the lesion, the, the diameter, it's more than a, the size of a pencil head eraser, and the lesion, um, the two major characteristics that I think patients and, and, and dermatologists really are looking for is evolution, whether these things are changing, and funny looking, and when I say funny looking, meaning it's funny looking compared to the other moles in the body, because some people have lots of funny looking moles, but they look very similar. But if one looks funny compared to the other ones, then, then or, or strange looking, then, then you really, that's one that you want to, to focus on. Here's another picture of a melanoma, and this is a, a skin, a cutaneous melanoma, but the other ones that we obviously worry about are ones that are in the nose, those are usually detected late because you detect it after somebody develops a nosebleed or headaches, or ocular melanomas, which usually are detected by ophthalmologists because there's a freckle there that grows over time. Some people will develop, you know, rectal melanoma is often misdiagnosed as hemorrhoids for a long time. Um, so um, the biology, though, is different, as I said. So if it starts in the skin, in sun-exposed skin, it's really very different than if it starts in non-sun-exposed areas, even though it starts from the same uh, cell type. Um, and so the, the natural history of melanoma is it, wherever it starts, um, usually when you d diagnose it, that's usually the only place that you see it. And sometime over the period of the growth of that tumor, it disseminates first through the lymphatics, which is different than the veins, right? It's, the lymphatics are sort of locally to the, to the regional draining lymph nodes. And that's where we first usually see a recurrence. And that's why people usually do a primary excision and then a, a sentinel node biopsy. But during the time that it's been, it, we can detect the primary or, it's, or, or in the regional nodes, it could have gotten into the bloodstream. And when it gets into the bloodstream, that's when it gets to other organs and forms what we call metastases. And as I said, those cells can remain dormant there for, for sometimes for 25 years before they start to grow. Now, a, 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 
a, a, a melanoma cell in a, in a lymph node is a, met, a metastasis. But when we speak about metastatic melanoma, we usually are thinking about cells that have gotten through the bloodstream to other organs, like the lungs, so distant metastasis, so away from the, the regional drainage. And it's metastatic melanoma that is potentially uh, life-threatening. It can go to any organ in the body. So this is an example of an unfortunate gentleman who had a, an acral indigenous melanoma started in his foot and just had, in addition to metastatic disease, had thousands of, of cutaneous lesions in the leg. A lot of people think that melanoma is a skin cancer and that it really manifests in the skin, but actually, it's actually relatively unusual. Most of the time when we see metastatic melanoma, it's actually in internal organs. So even though it starts in the skin, it's not really a skin cancer because when it spreads, it spreads to other internal organs. And this is an example, and you can see here, these are lung metastases. So the lungs are supposed to be this nice black color and these little white lines, really vessels. When you see these, these white balls in the, in, the, in the lung, those are lung metastases. And this is a, a patient who you know, had the very unfortunate circumstances, this is now many years ago when we saw this, this woman who had this very large sort of liver almost replacing part of her her liver. And so when we look for metastasis, we look everywhere, but we focus on CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis because most of the metastasis will be in lungs, liver, mesentery, GI tract, adrenal, other places. Um, and this is really one of the most frustrating um, areas of metastases, which is in the brain. So patients with melanoma have a very high propensity to develop lesions in the brain. It, in, in autopsy series done many years ago, people with metastatic melanoma who went on to die of their disease, um, probably 50 to 70 percent of them in the at, at autopsy series or during the course of a lifetime had a lesion in the brain, which is one of the highest incidence of brain metastases of all, all tumors. So in order to manage people effectively, it's very important to get when people first develop metastatic disease, meaning distant metastases in the lungs or the liver, we screen the brain um, probably every eight to 12 weeks because we now have techniques to manage these brain metastases relatively effectively. And in the old days, um, someone who would present with a brain metastasis would be thought to have a very poor prognosis. Now with the new therapies and with gamma knife radiation and surgery, um, people who present even with many brain metastases can still have very durable long remissions. And, I have a woman now who presented with maybe 35 brain lesions that we treated, and she's still alive three or four years later. And except for some of the damage, neurologic damage that was done by some of those brain metastases, she is almost completely normal and living a normal life now. So how do we treat a primary melanoma? Well, as most of you know, um, those, those patients have um, probably, it was detected by their primary care physician or their dermatologist, or really 50% of the, a good percentage of the time, it's actually detected by the, the patient themselves or the spouse, who says you have something on your back or you have something on your skin. They go to a dermatologist. A dermatologist makes a diagnosis. 90% of the time when we detect that primary lesion, there are no distant lesions at the time. And then uh, those patients are referred to surgeons. Usually we do a wide local excision. The surgeon will will take out a fair bit of tissue around that primary site because if you don't, there's a higher risk for local recurrence. Uh, although the, 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 the width of the excision doesn't affect overall outcome as far as we know. And then we do a sentinel node biopsy. And what we do is we inject a little dye or radioactivity at the site of the primary and we follow it up to the first lymph node and we take those lymph nodes out. Um, and the reason why we do that is not because we think that taking out those lymph nodes is going to result in a cure. At least medical oncologists don't think so. Surgeons think so, but medical oncologists don't. We know that this is just an indicator of disease going other places and that if you take out the local lymph nodes, you probably don't do anything about the, the cells that have already gotten to other places in the body. The surgeons believe that metastases go through the lymph nodes to other sites in the body, which is really not true. But nevertheless, a sentinel lymph node is important because it provides prognostic information. If there are cells in the lymph node, that means there's a higher chance for cells being other places in the body. And um, what that does is that, first of all, that tells us um, how often to screen people for metastatic disease. And it also tells us 
which patients we might consider for adjuvant therapies, being, adjuvant therapies, meaning giving them treatment at that point in time to try and prevent recurrence in the future. And although we don't have great drugs just yet, in the future, um, my guess is most patients with melanoma will actually have all these wonderful drugs that we're talking about now. They'll probably get it before they ever develop any distant disease. And in fact, we may be curing a lot of people at the, at, during their primary treatment, not, not when they develop metastatic disease. Um, so if, if, if we think based on the depth of the lesion or whether it's ulcerated or whether they have lymph nodes positive that they're high risk for occurrence, some of those high risk patients we do CAT scans or PET scans on a, on a regular interval to try and detect distant lesions because remember if someone has a lesion in the lung or a little lesion in the liver, they're not going to feel it. They're not going to know that that disease is there and so we want to detect that and provide treatment before people become symptomatic, before they develop symptoms. And in some cases, but not in all cases, if we see something in the sentinel node, the surgeon will then offer what's called a completion lymph node dissection, meaning they'll take out the rest of the lymph nodes there because sometimes some of those additional lymph nodes are involved and they provide the number of nodes provides prognostic information. So if we find more nodes positive in the, in the regional node, that, that tells us that there's a higher risk. But there's no evidence right at the moment. And again, I want to emphasize that either doing that sentinel node or the completion lymph node dissection really affects ultimate outcome. It provides important prognostic information. So when someone comes to see me and they've had a primary lesion taken out or a sentinel node, I ask these questions for them. What's my risk that, 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 that something will be found in my body in the future? Um, what can be done to lower my risk so that, that my cancer won't recur? And, and how am I going to be monitored to make sure that if it does recur, that I can start treatment right away. And those are the three most important questions that you can ask at that point in time. Um, risk is, is, as I said, based on a number of factors. We, we won't go through that in detail here. Um, there, there aren't great adjuvant therapies. Interferon, which is used to try and prevent recurrences in the future, is really kind of a really crummy drug with lots of toxicity and not a lot of efficacy. Um, and there was a new drug, ipilimumab, which, which you may have heard about, or your boy which we used to treat advanced disease, which was just approved in the last week in this setting. But it's at a very high dose of the drug. It comes with a lot of toxicity. And not all of us are certain that the, in this setting that the toxicity is worth the risk. Um, although there's no question that it's effective in, in, in preventing recurrences. So far, we don't have survival data, but it, it does seem to lower the risk of recurrence at three years. And it may be a much better drug than interferon. But the best drug in this setting will probably be the anti-PD-1 drugs that you've heard about. And those trials are just now uh, starting. And then in terms of monitoring for occurrence, that depends on risk. So if somebody has a very low risk for occurrence, we're not going to do CAT scans or, or PET scans because that would break the, 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 the bank for the world um, because it's a very, those are very expensive procedures with very, very low chance for detecting any metastatic disease. So the, the conundrum here is somebody who's got a low risk but still has a risk actually gets followed less carefully even though um, um, they, we, we still want to detect a disease early in that, that person. And so what the future holds hopefully is some sort of a blood test that's cheap that we can use to find um, um, the, the cancer earlier without having to do all of these expensive uh, scans. For people at high risk, it's certainly cost effective to do the, the scans, or at least I think so. So um, as I told you, the, there aren't a lot of options in this setting. Interferon, not a great drug. A lot of toxicity may reduce overall risk of recurrence by about 10%. Ipilimumab was just approved, but at a dose that's relatively toxic. Um, and even though we know how to manage the toxicity, it's very hard when maybe 50% of the people we treat might never have a recurrence at all to give all of those people the toxicity of this drug. There are targeted therapies that are being looked at in this setting. Um, and um, um, we still don't know what the efficacy is, but the targeted therapies are unlikely to be as effective in terms of getting rid of all of the cancer as our immune therapies. And so we are doing clinical trials right now, really looking at probably the best drug of all, which is the anti-PD-1 in this setting. And that could result in substantial number of cures so that patients never go on to develop metastatic disease. Um, so how do we manage advanced disease? Well, um, 
the, the, the key principle here is that what we're treating when somebody develops a lesion in the lung and in the liver is not just the lesions that we see, but the things that we don't see, because there are still areas of disease or cells that are there that haven't started to grow yet. And, and the reason why people get sick from cancer um, is, is that eventually either the cancer grows enough to take out an organ which we can't replace, or there's just so much cancer in the body that the things it produces makes them sick, and over time they wither and they, they can die from the disease. So the, the key principle of, of treatment, uh, even if you have a single lung lesion, is really systemic therapy because we're treating not only the thing that we see but the things that we don't see. Now, sometimes when there's a single lung lesion, we take that out and we wait. But even at our institution, I think we, we still consider those people for systemic therapies because even though they have a small chance, very tiny chance that we take out that lung lesion and nothing will come back, um, in, in most people, something will come back in other places. So we use that as a, as a sort of a sentinel. If, we, if we, we get rid of that lesion, we know we're getting rid of disease in other sites. But there are other things that we do. Sometimes there's a single lesion that's in a bad spot, and if it grows, it can cause pain or problems. And so in some people, in addition to the systemic therapy, we may take out that lesion or treat it with radiation. Brain metastasis are a good example because you don't want a brain lesion to grow. There's no room for things to grow in the brain. It can't expand like it can in the lungs. So those people, we may treat their brain lesions first very aggressively and then give them systemic therapy at that point. Um, but it's very important um, in order to, when we treat people to consider the issues of pain and cosmetic appearance. Um, and, and manage those as, as, as well as managing the whole disease. And we, we do other things. We, we have to manage the family and the expectations, and, and, and uh, we try and take all of those factors into consideration. So once someone develops advanced disease, um, we do, as I said, we screen the brain very aggressively, at least at baseline in every eight to 12 weeks, and we fight with the insurance companies about this because we think it makes a big difference in their care. And then we usually screen the we don't use a lot of PET scans at our institution. We do CT scans or MRIs of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. And usually we screen every eight to 12 weeks. And even at once somebody has had a very good response to treatment, um, for the first couple of years after that great response, we'll still do the scans every eight to 12 weeks, including the brain, for about the first two years until we're pretty confident that we're not gonna see any recurrence of disease. Um, so what are the options when when you have advanced disease. So um, this talk is different every six months because the field has moved so rapidly. Um, if, if we were in 2011, we might have said, oh, ipilimumab or your boy is the standard of care. Um, um, a year ago, maybe not even a year ago, well, maybe a year ago, we might have said anti-PD-1 is the standard of care. But um, the combination of anti-PD-1 and your boy um, at least the preliminary data certainly look very promising, and so at our institution, we tend to offer that combination first. It was just approved by the FDA um, a week ago, and whether someone has a mutation or not in BRAF, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, the immune therapies offer the chance for potential cure, and I'll talk a little bit about that also, but um, immune therapies are sort of the highest on the list of things that we we think about, and the standard of care has changed very rapidly over the last couple of years. Some people, up to maybe 40 or 50 percent of people with, with cutaneous lesions, will have a BRAF mutation. So that means that there's a, 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 a mutation in their tumor which drives the cancer. And so those mutations can be targeted by drugs called the brafinib and trametinib. Uh, and there's going to be another combination. And what those drugs do is they actually shut down that protein, which is driving the, the cell so, so hard. And, and when you shut down the, the function of that protein, the cell just sometimes either stops growing or just drops dead on the spot. And it, there's such dramatic treatments that um, somebody can come in and, and, and be so sick that they, if we didn't give them anything, they might die within two weeks of, or even within a week of treatment. And you can give them these drugs, and the, the lesions just melt away. You can almost see it, the, them melting away in front of your eyes. Um, so the responses to these drugs occur in almost every patient we treat, and the responses can be incredibly fast and dramatic. However, what we've learned is that these drugs, unlike immune therapies, very rarely cure 
patients from their, with their cancer. So um, uh, in most people who get these drugs, at some point their, their cancer will start to grow again. Um, and it's not clear to us what the best sequence of therapies are when somebody has a BRAF mutation. Um, a lot of us are convinced that, that if we use these agents first and then we try and give the immune therapies later, that the immune therapies might not work as well in that setting. So um, a lot of us who treat the disease will try and use immune therapies first, except in the few people where we just think the disease is growing so fast or, or they're just so sick that there's not enough time for the immune therapy to work. There are other mutations like NRAS, which we are just now learning how to target. There's a couple of investigational approaches for NRAS mutations, and there's one other mutation called CKIT, which is usually found in people who have melanomas in the mucosal surfaces or in the, the hands. Um, and, and patients who have CKIT mutations can respond to these agents which are on the market for other causes, CKIT inhibitors, and also have very dramatic responses to those agents. But again, targeted therapies in our mind are usually, for most people, second-line therapies. And then there's chemotherapy. And although chemotherapy is maligned because it's not very effective, there's a number of people who can have really dramatic responses to chemotherapy. And I have a couple of patients in my clinic that we treated with chemotherapy five or six years ago, had very advanced disease, had these amazing responses. They're still alive. They have no evidence of disease. And so um, when we run out of things to do, it's okay to try cytotoxic chemotherapy because some people can have very dramatic benefit, even if only for a few months. Um, so this is what things look like in 2015 today. <laughs> it may change tomorrow because, the, the, again, the field moves very, very quickly. Um, so there are targeted therapies and immune therapies, and there's chemotherapy. And um, these are our choices. There's anti-PD-1, and there's two drugs, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, which are almost identical. There's Yervoy or ipilimumab. Um, there's interleukin-2, which occasional patients will still receive. And then there are the targeted therapies, which hit specific mutations if, if the tumor contains those mutations. And usually we look for these mutations at the very beginning so that we know that we have other options to give our patients if the immune therapies don't work. So the real question is, who should get which drugs when? And that's really the complicated question. And so this is the, the algorithm that we use at Yale. Um, if someone comes in with brain lesions first, and we, remember we screen those, we usually try and treat those first. Even though those brain lesions can respond to systemic therapy, unless it's in a bad spot, we usually try and give this focused radiation first and get rid of those lesions. Um, if someone is eligible for immune therapy, whether or not they've had brain mats, we always try and give them immune therapies first because immune therapies can produce long, durable, and maintain remissions. And I want to emphasize that. That means that um, uh, regardless of how one gets there, at some point um, we can perhaps eliminate all the disease in an individual, and that disease may not relapse either forever or at least for many years. And that's the goal. The goal is always, um, and, and I emphasize this to my colleagues and I emphasize this to you, the, um, our field has, has been um, beset by a lot of negative thinking for many years where we tried to make cancer into a chronic disease. And that's really not what patients want. That's not what I would want. What, what patients want is they want us to treat their disease, and then they want to not see us anymore. <laughs> they want to go back to their normal lives. They're more than happy never to see me again if, if that were the case. And I'm very happy with that because I want them to feel like they don't have to worry about this problem anymore. So to me, I feel that if somebody has a bad disease, it's okay that they commit six months or seven or eight months or 12 months of their life to getting rid of the disease. But at that point, it's time to get back to what they, they normally do. So immune therapies, and the reason why um, our, our field and why we have this meeting is that there's a whole group of people that think that immune therapies are probably the best option that we have to produce these durable long-term responses. And so these drugs like anti-PD-1, ipilimumab, interleukin-2, and the combination of anti-PD-1 and CTLA-4 can achieve this in some subset of patients. At this time, my guess is that the best therapy would be anti-PD-1 plus anti-CTLA-4 to achieve this result. Now, I'm going to make some points later, which, will be, um, which, which you will see is applicable here. 
that immune therapy by itself may not be enough. We have to use other modalities in order to get to that goal of the long durable remission. Now, if <coughs> I'm getting short of breath, <laughs> maybe I need to work out some more. So the um, um, the if 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 people don't respond to immune therapies, then we need to offer them an alternative. So once we exhaust a number of immune therapies and it's not working, then we have no choice but to offer things that would extend life but may not cure. And, and then we, you know, we already have the mutation analysis. If they have a BRAF mutation, we can give them these wonderful targeted therapies that can produce these dramatic remissions. But we know that, that um, at some point we may have to do something else, but we may not have anything to do at that point. Um, and then if we have nothing to do, then there's chemotherapy or, or phase one drugs. And that's phase one drugs means drugs where we don't know for sure if they're going to work or not. They're brand new, but, but, but since there are no other options, we, we offer those to people who, who still are in good enough shape to, to be able to tolerate that. Um, so let me give you an example of a patient we treated back in uh, 2005 with interleukin-2. And this is true for any immune therapy, this can happen. So this is a gentleman, interestingly enough, has a BRAF mutation, but back then it didn't mean anything because we didn't have any drugs to give them, who came into us um, having had interferon uh, in the adjuvant setting, meaning after his primary tumor was taken out and he relapsed with multiple liver lesions, he had a big spleen lesion, and he had a lesion actually in the, behind his bottom. So we gave him high-dose interleukin-2, and you can see from here that all the liver lesions went completely away. Um, amazing response. But um, the spleen lesion did not go away, and the buttock lesion did not go away. So um, we sent him to a surgeon to take out the lesion in the spleen and the lesion in the buttock. So he lost his spleen, no big deal. You can live without a spleen. The lesion in the buttock came out very easily. And after that, um, so this is now somewhere around March of 2006, we noticed that he had a very tiny little lung nodule. And we followed that lung nodule without any treatment for about nine months. And in January of 2007, it had doubled in size, but it was still very small. And we thought, well, it's, it's continuing to grow. Let's just take it out. So I sent him to a surgeon in January of 2007. We took out that lung lesion. We've never treated him again since. That was January of 2007. It's now October of 2015, and he's remained disease-free for nearly um, uh, eight years, nine years, and I think he's cured of his cancer. And the, the principle here is that um, immune therapies, um, you're, the, 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 the melanoma, as it spreads to different places, every time it goes to a different spot, it's like a new... It's, it develops its own biology in that, so in that, in that area. So that it's very heterogeneous. And so that means that even though we might have eliminated 95% of his cancer, there were still two or three areas where the immune therapy didn't work. And we needed to use, in his case, uh, surgery in order to eliminate the rest of the disease. But then there was no other additional disease. And whatever immune response we generated in his body was enough to keep any tumor from coming back now for nine years. Now, we still see him every year. We've stopped doing CAT scans at this point. I guess after nine years, you have to <laughs> have some level of confidence that things are going well. And so now we just see him every six months with chest x-rays and blood work. But this is true for many patients with immune therapy where we see um, really dramatic regressions of large amounts of the disease, and then we have to do, over the course of a year or two, one or two extra things. Um, I treated another patient with ipilimumab, who uh, we call him Santa Claus because his, uh, he, he, that's what he actually does for a living. He's, he, <laughs> he, is, he, he, he is Santa Claus for a living. Um, he gives out his card as Santa Claus, so, um, um, so I go around saying that I've cured Santa Claus. Um, <laughs> And uh, um, he had complete regression of lung lesions and subcutaneous lesions. And at two years, another reason why we screened the brain very aggressively, he had a single new brain lesion, which we treated with gamma knife radiation. That was about four years ago. Hasn't had any disease recurrence since. So we have many examples like that. Um, on the other hand, here's an example of a patient who received Yervoy. This is in 2007. He had. Um, 
uh, hundreds of lung metastases. I mean, every cut looked like this. Every one of these balls is a lung met. Six weeks later, this is what his scan looked like. Almost everything had gone away. You can see that there's still little, little balls here. However, we've never treated him again since those first two doses in 2007. His x-ray has never changed over that period of time. He also had two baseline brain lesions. We, in him, we did not have a chance to treat those brain lesions first. And the brain lesions went completely away at six weeks. And uh, although he had to have a couple of brain surgeries for what we call necrosis. So these were areas of disease that had been treated previously that had become very inflamed. There was no tumor there. So we just had to take it out in order to get rid of the inflammation and make him symptomatically better. This is a patient that we treated with anti-PD-1 in 2008, one of the first people um, to receive the multi-dose regimen of anti-PD-1 with metastatic melanoma. He had progressed on high dose IL-2. This is this big thing right here, which is um, 15, 18 centimeters, um, a pretty big lesion. Um, almost melted away. However, this is what's left. Now, we've done a PET scan here, and the PET scan is negative, and there's no evidence of disease, and he has not recurred now. It's now seven years for, for this patient. This is a woman, and this is another a, sort of an example of something that can happen. This is one of the first patients to go on to the ipilimumab nivolumab trial, which we helped develop with, with Dr. Wolchuk at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And this woman had a mucosal, very aggressive mucosal melanoma um, to multiple sites. Um, you can see that she had a lesion here. And um, um, she was interesting because we gave her a single dose of drug. She developed um, uveitis, which means inflammation of the eyes. And so she called two weeks after the first dose of treatment and said, I can't see. And so we got very freaked out. And we, um, we, we brought her into the hospital. We gave her high doses of steroids. And we never gave her another dose of treatment from that point. Um, I'll get to, to another issue later. She had multiple other sites of disease. But by the time we did the first CAT scan, almost all those sites of disease had gone completely away with a single dose. And this is a patient who had Mucosal melanomas, which as you know, is a very aggressive type of melanoma, generally not considered very responsive to immune therapy. So um, interestingly enough, two and a half years later, she developed a little bit of anemia. And when we scanned her, she had this huge gastric mass. So uh, you know, if you're not used to looking at this, this is a really very impressive tumor, which is taking up a good part of her stomach. And um, we went to Bristol and we requested permission and they gave it to us to give her the same drugs again, the ipilimumab and nivolumab again. So we gave her those drugs with very concern that she might have recurrent uveitis, which she didn't. And this was a scan that was done at 12 weeks and she's now in a complete remission. She completed about a 12-month period of nevo maintenance. And I don't think she'll ever recur again. She had an outstanding response. So. Another uh, sort of lesson here is that if you respond to these drugs, you stop the drugs, and at some point the disease comes back, which it does in a few people, sometimes you can treat with the same drugs again and get another outstanding remission, um, which is a very different than the way we think about other kinds of drugs for cancer. This is a patient who, um, we don't need to go through all these in detail, but also was treated on a ipilimumab nivolumab trial who came in with, he had disease in his gastrointestinal tract, he was bleeding, he was sick, he couldn't eat, he had tumors everywhere on his body. Um, within 12 weeks, most of these tumors had regressed, and he remains in a near complete remission, um, now off therapy for some time, with no evidence of disease. These are just other scans. And this uh, woman who had had IL-2 in the past and had had a targeted therapy and radiation came in with this big mass right here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, in pain, her leg was swollen. Within seven to 10 days, um, her pain went away. Uh, in three weeks, her, her abnormal LDH, which is a measure of disease activity, had normalized. And she's, um, she received six months of treatment, four, four of the combination doses and six months of Nevo. But then she just told us she didn't want to see us anymore. So we're, we only make her come back every three months for scans. We stopped her treatment, and she's doing great. And then last. Um, the pseudo progression here's this is a patient who um, uh, had an outstanding clinical response in thousands of lung meds but when we did his first brain scan he had two tiny new lesions but the rest of his his, his systemic disease was responding so we just decided to wait and rescanned him every six weeks to see what would happen 
And at the first six weeks interval, these lesions grew a little bit. Six weeks later, they started to shrink. And now they're completely gone. And we never had even had to treat his lesions with gamma knife radiation. So we left him alone, and the brain lesions went away on their own. This is his lungs. I don't know if you can tell all these little spots in the lungs, but they all are almost completely gone. So I've given you examples of sort of these amazing responses that can occur with immune therapy. Uh, some people out now seven or eight years, and you've seen the data from Dr. Rosenberg, or maybe you haven't seen it, but Dr. Rosenberg has patients who've treated with IL-2 20 years ago, 30 years ago, who are still in remission today. <clears throat> so what about adverse events? So we'll go through this very quickly. Um, I'm sure people can get sick with immune therapies, and they can get very sick. And so this is your immune system attacking your normal tissues. You heard a little bit from Evan Lipson. Um, I'm not going to go through it in detail. The, the important thing is that um, um, these side effects are reversible in most people. Um, some people are left with um, um, things that we can't reverse. You, you can lose your pituitary, for example, and for that we have to replace people with hormones for the rest of their lives. But in general, for the activity that we've seen, um, we've, we believe that the, the risks are worth the benefit uh, that we get with these drugs. Um, some people, we have to treat them with immune suppressive agents for a while in order to cool off their immune system. But eventually, we get people off of their immune suppression. And eventually, most people will um, recover completely from their adverse effects. And unlike chemotherapy, I don't think we've done, at least to most of their major organs, we haven't done any major damage. Um, so um, these are the big questions now for the treatment of advanced disease. And I'll stop here. Well, I'll stop in just a slide or two and take questions. Um, what do we do if they have a BRAF mutation? Do we give them targeted therapy or immune therapy first? We usually give immune therapy. If immune therapy is what we're going to give, do we give anti-PD-1 alone or the combination? And in our hands, we, we tend to lean towards the combination. Um, if we give anti-PD-1 first for any reason, how, how do we treat those patients in the second line setting if they don't respond? Um, we don't really yet have great predictive biomarkers, so we don't have great ways of doing a test up front to tell us what the best approach will be for an individual patient. And obviously, we want to know what, how to really improve, even though we've made enormous advances, how to, how to get even, even better from here on out. Um, there are a number of things. Not everybody is, comes in with just melanoma. Like, like everything else, there's a lifetime of things that have happened to people before we see them. And so the treatment considerations really depend on what else has happened to that individual before we see them. Prior autoimmunity, whether they're on steroids for the reason. Some people have come in with renal failure, for example, and they're on dialysis. Some people have had hepatitis before. Um, uh, some people may have just may be sick for other reasons, have heart problems and lung problems, and all of that is taken into consideration when we choose a treatment. This is just a slide showing that the predictive biomarker doesn't really help you for, for, for picking anti-PD-1 versus something else. It works whether your PD-L1 level is, is present or not. Um, and this is data with a combination showing that maybe the combination for this endpoint of progression-free survival is then the anti-PD-1 is maybe just as good as a combination, but this data is faulty because progression-free survival is not perhaps a, a, a good surrogate for overall survival. And so even though oncologists look at this data and say, well, maybe if they're pd one positive, we can get away with anti-PD-1 alone, which is a lot less toxic, that may or may not be the right decision for an individual. Um, so this is my last slide. and. Um, I just want you to get an idea of what, the, what, the, um, what we're doing in order to try and improve outcome in immune therapies. So um, we've identified um, a lot of other factors within the tumor microenvironment that may be inhibiting those lymphocytes from working well. And we've also identified um, patients in whom they don't have a lot of lymphocytes in their tumor, and we have to do something to get those lymphocytes in there. The problem is, is that for any individual that comes to see us, we can't figure out yet what the problem is, right? So they come to us, we, we, we may get their tumor or their peripheral blood, and we may measure a number of things, but we can't really at this point, we're not good enough to say, you need X, Y, and Z, or you need X followed by Y followed by C. So we make guesses. 
Right now, our best guess, and we, that was a good guess, was to combine ipilimumab and nivolumab. But biology is very complicated. There are lots of things going on. There's probably a thousand variables that impact um, on your immune response, and I'll have a slide in my next presentation to understand why that is. But there are all these things that we're investigating, and at the moment, we don't know what's going to work, and we don't actually know what's, what's important. But it's, I guess it's important for you to understand that there's a huge uh, effort out there to try and figure out what the next step will be in the development of active therapies. And maybe we'll figure it out. <laughs> We've been very lucky so far. Um, um, and I do think some of these things have enormous amount of promise. So I'll stop there, and I'll, I'm happy to take any, any questions.